After these uh, days of uh, learning about Gromox and the PMX, the energy calculations, MD, uh, it's my pleasure now to uh, introduce you to Christian Magreta from AstraZeneca, one of the uh, co organizers of this uh, event. And uh, Christian will talk a bit more how how these applications are used in uh, also from the industry point of view for the development of novel drugs. And it's a, a good example for for the usage of the applications. Uh, so now we can see Christian's uh, screen. All right. Um, thanks, Ross. Yeah. And thanks for the opportunity um, to give this talk. Well, preparing uh, for that, I thought what would be interesting to you guys um, as a of different angle from the industry. So we have been applying MD simulations. In so I'll talk a bit about that and also how it fits into our pipelines. And, and this will be a very biased um, pipeline, obviously, um, because that's what we do in-house. But also, uh, if you replace um, individual steps with other tools, the overall workflow scheme will stay the same. Um, yeah. So at the end, so bear with me for a bit. Um, at the end, I'll, I'll show you where MD simulations can actually impact drug discovery. Oh, that doesn't work. Okay, so um, just as a bit of, of an introduction, so AstraZeneca is a global pharmaceutical company, so we're what really considered to be big pharma, and we have three different research and development sites in Gatlesburg, in Cambridge, and where we are located in Gothenburg. And more specifically, I am part of the molecular AI department, so molecular artificial intelligence. Um, and we deal with two main questions in, in drug design. The first one being what to make next. So this is the um, compound ID generation, what could be a potential new drug. It's often referred to as uh, the Novo design. Um, and this is also the team I'm in. So we can talk a bit more about the exploitation, exploration scenarios that we usually have and the main tools, um, uh, one of which is reInvent, and all of our tools are published. So if you're interested, you can look at those. So these are idea generation tools, really, um, using uh, uh, deep neural networks. And the other question is, well, how to make it? And that's something that's often maybe not, not fully appreciated outside the industry, but uh, it's actually a big, big problem to synthesize ideas that come out of our idea generation pipeline. The best idea doesn't help if you don't, if you don't know a way how to make it, right? Um, and this is what the synthesis prediction or deep chemistry team is dealing with. So they built a tool called AI Synth that allows you to predict reaction pathways um, in order to, or routes in order to get to the end of a comp, uh, to get a compound out in the end. We're also involved in other activities, uh, most prominently Melody. So that's a, a data sharing, privacy preserved data sharing effort across the industry um, to, to build better predictive models, but it's not part of the talk today. So um, in the first day, we heard a very nice talk about the complications in drug discovery. Um, so that saves me the, the hassle of going through it in too much detail again. But it, it's um, safe to say that drug discovery still is very slow and expensive. And in silico methods have helped a bit there. But if you look at the, the graph on the right, it's still um, the case that we start with a lot of compounds in the early stage. And then um, a lot of them are, are filtered out along the way, maybe because of uh, liabilities and toxicity. And in the end, you have one marketed medicine after a couple of years and hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, so this is, this is still a problem. And if we can improve our predictions, um, we, we have a better, if you start here with better compounds, then the, the chance that we get something through is higher, right? So that's, that's the whole idea. And another development that has um, like gotten some momentum recently is that we can divide patients in, in smaller groups. So that's what we call patient stratification um, because we understand much more about the, the, the causes for this disease. Say. And that, that is great because then we can um, generate bespoke medicines. But on the other hand side, that also leads to an explosion in the number of targets that we have to address. So um, to sum that up, our business success requires a reduction in the cycle time and I'll introduce the cycle on the next slide. And also the costs for the uh, famous LI LO or lead identification optimization phase. So the DMTA side, the sign of a new compound set, then you make it, then you test it in certain assays, you analyze the data, and whatever you learn from there, 
you feed back into the design stage and then you iterate that on something that is that is um, well uh, uh, good enough to be propagated down downstream. And our our team, our department works on the design stage. So I'll focus mostly on the idea generation bit here. We try to publish our stuff and, and uh, we also try to publish the source code. So if you're interested, you can have a look here into those. Um, but I haven't really explained what makes it so difficult for us to generate new ideas. And I think this, this might, might help there. So if you look at the, at the chemical, so the, the collection of all of the compounds that it could potentially make, and this is just an illustration here, then this is enormous. This is, uh, to be est this is estimated to be on the order of 10 to the power of 60 compounds that it could in principle look at. However, realistically, we can only access something on the order of 10 of to the power of 10 or 10 to the power of 12. So what we will end up with is a very, very sparse set of, of areas, of sub, subspaces in chemical space where we know something about and large where we have absolutely no idea. So, um, or what it what it's, says here, we have access to only a very negligible fraction of the chemical space. What can we do? So one way to generate new, new ideas is to, uh, for example, which, um, which I'll introduce. So that's a tool that we developed in how that's why I'm mentioning it, but there are a lot of different tools that you can apply to that as well. Here is that you take a very, very large data set of molecules for example, database, and then you train a neural network on, on that to reproduce that. And if you do that properly, then the network will not learn to reproduce the training examples. That would be relatively meaningless, but it will learn the rules of chemistry. And that means that it will deduce implicitly from all the examples um, it has seen that it's not a good idea to add six substituents to a carbon atom, for example. So what you will end up with, and that's the changing color of these um, weights here, is a, a generative model that has a very good capacity. So if you think back on this, um, picture of space that I just showed, we we're able to access a lot of different spaces or a lot of different areas because our model has a, a high generative capacity. But it, so if you start with that trained model, um, it will spit out just molecules. They may, they may conform to the, the rules of chemistry, that's fine, but they may be um, relevant for a project at hand. So let's say we want to fit a molecule um, into this binding cleft here and inhibit some target because that's relevant for the disease, then it's very unlikely that just by chance we get something out that actually fits here. So what we do then with our prior or, or um, naive model is that we um, subject it to reinforcement learning. So we let it generate compounds, um, run that through some scoring function. I'll come back to that on the next slide. And then the score is fed back to update the, the internal weights. So once in a while, uh, just by chance, it will receive a medium score or something that's slightly better than, than rubbish. And from that, it can learn and optimize the internal weights. And if you do that long enough, and typically we're looking at um, cycle numbers of 1,000 to 3,000 iterations, then you end up with a uh, bespoke model that is able to generate relevant given project. And for the next project, you do the same, the same approach again. So one, one thing that I should mention, we're actually really good in generating compounds. So they look good, they conform to certain rules like that. Uh, the problem is the scoring. So um, there are all sorts of different scoring components that you can feed in here, um, but it's especially binding affinity remains a bit elusive. This is how we construct the scoring function and ignore the, the equation on the bottom. It's really just a composite of different components. So each of these components describes the molecules in a different way. So this could be molecular weight, say. So you, you penalize everything that's too small or too big, and within a certain range, um, it receives a good score. So you will end up in the end with um, compounds that have a certain size. The second one could be the number of hydrogen bond donors. Um, so you want to limit that, maybe not to go crazy, and so on and so forth. Um, now, what is really what would be really cool here is to get structural information in, and that's something that we've been working on quite a bit. Um, and in our first attempt, what we did is we wrapped several docking backends, and that's from a recent uh, preprint that we, that we put on archive. Um, and that is just one of the scoring components. So what happens is that you embed the compounds, you dock them, and the docking score is then fed back to inform the agent. And over time, it learns how to generate 
molecules that, that produce a better docking score. That's illustrated in this graph here. Um, I won't go into the details, but um, this was a public data set. We didn't tell the agent anything about the structure that it should generate, other than it should have higher or a good docking scores. And you can see that um, if you look at the motor similarity, so that's the similarity measure of the compounds produced to known actives, so things that we know that are binding. You see that you have um, at least a couple that um, very might very well come also from the, the active set that the agent hasn't seen. And although the decoy set was much, much larger, you don't see that in here. So that's the, the idea. OK, so so far, I haven't talked about MD simulations at all. But if you think about the, the limitations that docking has as a proxy for binding affinity, it becomes clear where we are going here. Um, but just to give you an overview, so I thought about what, what kind of applications we have internally for MD simulations at this, at this moment, um, and also ask colleagues what they do in, in everyday, everyday life. Uh, this is just a small overview here. So all of what I talked about so far is concerning small molecules, so the things we just seen. But there's also a big push towards new modalities or, or biologics. So this could be peptides or uh, oligonucleotides, for example. So in the small molecules world, what we could do is we use MD simulations for receptor configuration sampling. So instead of just having one X-ray structure um, for a docking um, virtual screening, for example, or even using it in reInvent as a score component, we could have multiple taken from a, a MD simulation. Another thing that a couple of colleagues do is uh, using MD simulations as some sort of sanity check for docking poses. We're also in the process of using it for pocket identification. So that is very important if you have to decide whether a target is druggable, as we say. So whether it's actually suitable to be targeted by small molecules or not. And that's still a very tricky question. Because to actually know that, you would have to have the, the product, the molecule already, right? So you need to, you need to uh, define whether a pocket would in principle qualify to be druggable or not. But the biggest um, impact that MD simulations have had and will have to have is um, relative and absolute binding free energy calculations. And I'll come back to that. Actually, it's very nice that, that Vita's talks um, just introduced that concept so, so neatly. Um, yeah, but for new modalities, it's more about the structural understanding. So this is very early days. We're applying, applying it to a lot of different um, new targets that are not druggable by small molecules, but it's, it's still wild west. Um, so it's not, it's not a really streamlined process. And that's across the industry, that's not just us. But you could also use it uh, in principle to predict properties such as the melting temperature uh, from MD simulations. But going to small molecules, this is just what I, what I introduced to so the receptor configurations. Are, so instead of just taking a, a crystal structure, you use it to actually run an MD simulation over the course of 100 nanoseconds or so. You cluster it and then you select representative confirmations um, from, these, from these snapshots, right? And that's actually something that we uh, recently implemented um, to do ensemble docking in the reinforcement learning group of reInvent's idea generation. So that should help us enrich the configurational sampling um, a lot. Um, the other thing is just simply running Holos simulations. And we have automated workflows to do that using Gromax. And this is from one of these, this is just a test run. So um, you have a protein and the docked, or actually it's native ligand. So you have a ligand attached to it. And then you see how, how this um, um, part of the protein changes over the course of this um, simulation. And you can use that to, to check whether a docking pose is, is reasonable or not. So if you see that ligand flying away after two nanoseconds, um, it's probably not a good, not a good thing. So this helps to enhance our structural understanding um, and as I said, it, it serves as a sanity check for docking poses. One thing that chemists like a lot, um, it's also showing you time-resolved interactions. So if there is a, a hydrogen bond, for example, that is supposedly very, very important, then you see it appearing and disappearing on, over the course of the simulation. And that is something that they can relate to a lot. So what is often misunderstood is that we need to convince chemists to actually invest resources to do what we propose they should do. And we're competing with a lot of other techniques and, and uh, inputs. So we have limited resources and we need to allocate, it, uh, allocate them the best, right? So um, MD simulations are an excellent communication tool as well. Um, but the biggest impact of 
at least in the small molecule world, um, of MD simulations is relative binary free energies, at least to this day. So what we often end up with is a representative set of novel ideas or a series. So we have an initial hit, let's say it's this compound here in the middle, and then we, some way or another, we get um, a whole set around this initial hit. So that could be enumeration, that could be by reinvent, whatever. And these are 2D. So if we want to actually calculate that, so what we actually want to, I should add that. So what we want to have is um, we want to get um, some insights, whether it would be a good idea to go to this or this or this um, derivative of the initial hit. And binding affinity is a very important criterion. So the first step is to embed these 2D molecules in 3D. You also take care of things like stereochemistry and uh, protonation states, etc. Once you've done that, you can you can use stocking to fit these molecules into the binding cleft that you have defined using the reference ligand usually. So what we start with internally is most most often is one or multiple X-ray structures and some experimentally determined binding affinities. From that, and I'm brushing over a lot of details here, but from that you can um, construct what we call a perturbation map. Um, that's that's how we communicate it internally, but you could also see that as a uh, a bunch of um, transitions from here to there, from here to there, simply, right? So it's a pairwise, pairwise thing. Um, and again, for this central one here, let's say we have a experimental, experimentally determined binding affinity. Then you run your MD simulations, and from the trajectories you obtain at the annotated perturbation map, and that's what we communicate um, to the chemists, so they can see, well, okay, going from here to there, here to there, is might be preferable. Um, and often they look at the, the snapshots that we get from the MD simulations and say, oh, okay, this is picking up a new interaction here, or this is um, important because there was a, a water there, stuff like that. So this is, re this is really, really good for hypothesis building. And it works better than docking um, because it takes more into account. So for example, receptor dynamics and a whole bunch of other properties. And as I said, it's, making, it's helping in making a case. So unfortunately, I cannot show you <clears throat> Um, internal project data, but I can assure you that we have successfully applied that to a number of different um, projects from different disease areas uh, in the last two and a half years, I would say, or three years maybe. Um, but this is a, a project of uh, a colleague of mine where he was involved in, in generating it. And this has been published. So you see that here we have this uh, scaffold here. And what they did is they they, uh, they exchanged this R group here by fluorine, chlorine, and so on. Um, and they were able to identify a couple of nice things um, that also paved a bit the way. So it was published recently, but it's older work, I believe. So this paved a bit the way for, for other follow-up studies. So they identified a pocket and also were able to use FEP on those things. And this is great. Um, the main problem, you can already see that probably here, is that these methods require you to have a large chunk of the molecule to be the same. And that's, what just, that's just what uh, Vita has alluded to. So that you have to have a certain um, phase space overlap here. So these are, in other words, these modifications here are relatively small. So if you look at another compound um, like this, and let's say this is our starting molecule, then it's an easy task to go from here to there, right? So and this number here indicates how far they are apart um, structurally. But it might be more tricky to do these jumps. And these jumps here might be, so going from here to there might already out, be out of scope for relative binding for energy techniques, right? But unfortunately, that's exactly what we're more and more interested in, doing these scaffold hops or um, jumps outside the known chemical space. This is very important because sometimes we have liabilities, um, toxicity issues, off-target effects, um, or other things that just, just won't work, and you can already see that. So it's actually quite uh, disappointing if you have compounds that bind well, show good enzymatic inhibition, but then for some other downstream problem like toxicity, um, they, will never, they will never make it to the market, right? And then we're looking for a backup series. And that would be great if you could do that simply by, by going from here to there or even ignoring completely where we started from in the, in the first place. To drive that point home in a slightly different representation, so consider this UMAP embedding here. So this is based on structural descriptors of fingerprints of compounds. So this is representing chemical space. Each of these dots is one compound, and these are completely arbitrary dimensions. Don't, don't worry about them. It just means that these points here are closer to, together to one another than these points here. 
Um, and let's assume we start here in the standardization stage, and this is the compound we're looking at. Then using um, relative binding free energy methods, we could access maybe something within the, the circle here, right? So uh, we, could, we, do, we could explore these other molecules in here. And that's great. Um, but one problem, but what about, um, or the biggest problem here is what about the other scaffolds that might be interesting here as well, right? Some of them might be more easily accessible, but for others, this jump might, this jumps might be just too far. Um, what we do now, oh, what we do now in, in this, um, oops, sorry, my pointer disappeared. So what, what we do at the moment is that we would ask the, the synthetic teams to synthesize something in here and also get a new crystal structure and then we take it from there. And this takes time, this takes money, and you might be unlucky and, and pick one of these candidates in here that are just not active. So you would discard this whole area just because this could be a treasure trove, right? But you're just discarding it because you made the wrong pick. And that's not great. So what, what I would prefer, what, what we would prefer to do is we could simply access these things right out of the box. Um, yeah, so much for small molecules. And now I have one slide. On, on new modalities. So we're also investing a lot into oligonucleotides because they, are, have, they have different mode of action. So they hybridize with some RNA. And in this case for ASOS, they hybridize with some RNA in the cell that is degraded. And, and by that you can target things that are not druggable by small molecules. And as I said, this is very early stage. So we, we're still trying to find the right setups, both experimentally and computationally. Um, these were some initial simulations we, we ran with our automated pipeline. So you have a simulation time here, 100 nanoseconds, and three identical replicates. It's just they just differ in the initial velocities. And what we did is we did a, a backbone clustering. Um, so you see that if you look at the populations, overall populations, you see that the, the first cluster is almost 50%. And this is the CMS, the central member structure of that cluster. So it's a fairly stretched um, um, configuration. And you see that appear and disappear over the course of the simulation um, quite a bit in the first two, at least. So here we have a couple of problems that we need to address and, and we're recruiting people to do that, but we're also reaching out to, to academic um, collaborators because as um, um, Vita said, the force fields are not that great and we need to do all sorts of modifications here. So it, this is really a tricky bit. Also, we don't reach convergence in these small timescales and a lot of other issues that, that happen here. Um, I just wanted to bring it up because this is a different angle um, where MD simulations will have an impact in the future because structurally those things are not very accessible. Okay, um, so that is already the wrap up slide uh, to, to like bring together what, what requirements we have to make the biggest impact in pharma. First of all, we need accurate results. And I put accurate in quotation marks here because we're not necessarily concerned with a certain threshold. Say we don't need to, uh, the results to be within half a kcal per mole or something to be useful. For us, it's often enough to just be able to rank them. We have pipelines that require a certain uh, feed in at any given time. So if I was able to, to rank a couple of compounds, say 100 compounds, and I say, take these 20, put them forward, and there are a couple of hits there that's, that's uh, often that, that would suffice completely, right? Um, and it's also good to build um, convincing hypotheses. That has changed a lot in the last years um, because we had successful project impact. Um, people consider MD simulation as being some, uh, a technique that is more trustworthy than it used to be um, maybe five or 10 years ago. We also need sufficient throughput um, because that's something that's also uh, maybe something that's, that's not immediately clear. These uh, DMTA cycle iterations have become very, very fast. So projects meet, or projects change the goalposts a lot. So if it takes me a couple of weeks to come up with an answer to problem A, problem A might not be relevant anymore once I have my answer. So we need to, that's another thing. So if I had to balance accuracy and throughput, I would often um, be on the side of throughput just because Having a, a reasonable answer now is superior to having the best answer later, later down the road, right? Um, then what we need, this is more of a practical thing, of course, we need automated and stable workflows. So MD simulations haven't had a reputation for being incredibly stable. 
and that's a problem because um, there are a lot of different options for people to do that, for comp chemists to, to come up with solutions. And if it doesn't work a couple of times, they won't come back. They simply drop that and do something else. Um, so that's also something that we are working on to provide those tools to wrap what comes out from academia or from um, also proprietary software uh, developers and, and make that work for our uh, scientists. And that brings me to the next part, so ease of use. You have to think that there's a lot of different people using your software. It will not just be computational chemists that invest a lot of time to setting those things up. So one, one of the biggest edges that, that um, proprietary software has over academic codes is the ease of use. Um, just the way it's interfaced with a GUI or something that helps a lot. Yeah, and last but not least, um, we have and we want to collaborate with academia um, because we are not we're not in a position to build our own protocols, right? So the, the non-equilibrium approach that we just introduced in the previous talks, we wouldn't have had the resource to come up with something like that. So we, we rely on academia to, to develop that with and for us. And that's why BioXL is so great from our perspective. Um, and we're also shifting a lot of uh, interest on Gromex and, and especially PMX from the Growth Lab. Um, so we hope that we can collaborate further with Vitas and BERT. Yeah, and that brings me to the end of, of the talk. So this is, this is the department at the moment. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Richard, this was a, a very good uh, overview of the uh, methods used uh, by pharmaceutical companies. Uh, there is a question in the chat. Which method are you using for uh, relative binding free energy calculations? Do you use FEP plus? Yeah. Um, as, as, of, as of now, yes. FEP plus is the one that we mostly rely on in-house. We're trying to explore different things, both from other vendors, but also from academia. But FEP plus has, has certain edges that I cannot comment on that, that we need at the moment. Hmm. Yeah, as you you were explaining, it's a, it's a very difficult area. One needs to, to use a lot of different methods to try to find consensus with different applications. So it's it's very challenging. It's not straightforward. Uh, we're still not at a point in science and technology where you can just push a button and it will give you a, yeah. <laughs> a drug that works. Uh, but uh, overall, I think. Uh, yeah, science has made tremendous progress in this direction, and uh, hopefully we'll get closer and closer to this. Uh, Absolutely. And, and as I said, there are a lot of uh, projects in-house that, that are running a uh, a main or a backup series that was derived using those methods, right? So this is not this is not hypothetical anymore. This is not what mm -hmm. could be done. This is being done. Yes. All right. Uh... I don't see other questions in the chat. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Christian, uh, for the presentation. Uh, and thank you, everyone. Now we are going away for a break until 2 p.m. Central European time, when we will continue with uh, docking and uh, specifically presentation by Alexander Bonven with, about Haddock one of the very popular applications in the field. So thank you for the morning session. Thanks for all the presenters. And we'll see each other in one hour and 30 minutes.